The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Leveraging Trope to Expression in NSCLC. Preparing to identify therapeutic candidates, educate your patients, and utilize novel trope 2 targeting ADCs in clinical practice. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash RGD 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this PeerView CNE activity, Leveraging Trope 2 Expression in Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer. I'm Dr. Benjamin Levy. I'm an associate professor at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and I'm joined today by a wonderful group of panelists, faculty, experts, and I'll, and I'll let them introduce themselves. And I'll start with Jacob. Jacob says I'm a thoracic medical oncologist at Dana-Farber. Solange? Solange Peters, I am the director of medical oncology in Lausanne, in Switzerland. And Charu? Hi, Charu Agarwal. I'm an associate professor for lung cancer excellence at University of Pennsylvania's Abramson Cancer Center. Great. Uh, fabulous to have you all here today to, to layer in your expertise and your insights on the role of ADCs, specifically trope 2 ADCs in non-small cell lung cancer. So what are our goals for today? One, to augment your knowledge of trope 2 targeting ADCs and the expanding evidence supporting their use in non-small cell lung cancer, enhancing your skills and identifying patients with lung cancer who are most likely to benefit from novel trope 2 targeting ADCs. I think there's a lot of work going on looking for that right patient population with biomarker enrichment strategies. And then also to equip you with skills to optimally use the trope 2 targeting ADCs and the treatment of lung cancer. So we'll get started with module one, targeted delivery of potent payloads in lung cancer, understanding the basics or the ADCs of ADCs. And this will be done by Dr. Jacob Sand. Thank you so much. So we're gonna go over really the basics of antibody drug conjugates. Uh, first of all, we'll start with the components. Now there are three major components, but those really start with something on the tumor cells themselves. So first of all, before we get into the components of the antibody drug conjugates, what exactly are we targeting? And that's the antigen on tumor cells. Now the ideal antigen is something with high expression, high concentration within the tumor cells that is absent from normal cells, because that's really what we're targeting for drug delivery. Um, now getting into the components of the, uh, of the antibody drug conjugate, then it's having an antibody that will target that antigen. Uh, something with high affinity and avidity for that antigen is ideal. Uh, something with a long half-life and high molecular weight so that really it can circulate through the bloodstream, finding that target, so eventually buying to that. Another component then is the payload, and this is the actual chemotherapy portion of this, or, or at least right now, and what we're going to be discussing is chemotherapy. Uh, of course, there are potential uh, other uh, payloads that can be added, and I think that's something we can look forward to in future generations of, uh, of antibody drug conjugates. But in this case, we're talking about chemotherapy payloads, um, this is uh, a way of really de delivering high potency chemo to the cell since it is that targeted delivery of it. There are really, uh, there, there are multiple different payload options. Um, and you can see at the bottom there, DXD or copolysomerase 1 inhibitor. This is uh, one of the common, uh, um, uh, well, DXD is a copolysomerase 1 inhibitor. Copolysomerase 1 inhibitor as a class is one of the common uh, chemotherapy payloads that's added to this microtubule uh, inhibitor is also another common one. And then really the DAR. So this is the drug to antibody ratio. So the amount of uh, payload that's on each of these antibodies. And that generally ranges two to eight. And we'll talk briefly about uh, the optimization of that. The other component is the linker. And so that linker is what's holding that payload to the antibody. And there are two major ways of, uh, of uh, our categories for that linker technology being cleavable or non-cleavable. Essentially, starting with non-cleavable, that's one that holds much tighter, and that's really where the payload does not get released other than being in the lysosome. So once the drug is actually delivered to the cells and it's intracellular, then within the lysosome is where you get that release of the drug into the cells. Cleavable uh, releases a little bit more easily, and that can be based upon pH or other factors that release that. And there's a real balance there where you want to make sure that that payload really gets released when it's at the right 
target when it's in the area of the tumor cells. Uh, at the same time, uh, not releasing too easily within the bloodstream where you can get a lot of off-target effects from just pre-circulating uh, payload or chemotherapy in this case. And so there's a balance to those. Now, how do they work? I think in many ways, when I talk with patients about antibody drug conjugates, I often talk about targeted chemotherapy. This is a way of delivering chemotherapy to the cells and intracellular. Um, now, that being said, it has some of the toxicities of chemotherapy, and this really varies quite a bit from drug to drug, and, and we'll get into some of that. As far as the mechanism of action, I've mentioned it briefly, but but we'll go through this now step by step. And this is the, the antibody drug conjugate get circulating through the bloodstream, binds to that antigen, and gets pulled into the cell, releases that chemotherapy, that payload, into the cell, uh, causing cell death. And when you get apoptosis of the cell, you then get release of that payload into the circulating uh, tissue. Now, when that payload is membrane permeable, could also have what's called a bystander effect. So although the drug wasn't delivered uh, to the antigen on surrounding cells, that payload can actually cross through the membrane and have an effect. And so in this case, you can have actually cell or a tumor cell kill even without having that antigen expressed. So you don't need the antigen expressed on every single cell as long as you have it within the area of, of each of those uh, areas of tumor. At the same time, it can also potentially on the left side, you see there the FC-mediated uh, stimulation of immune cells. And so there, there is a potential immune effect that, that can uh, happen due to the antibody drug conjugate. We can get into that a little bit more as we move along. So to speak briefly on the DAR, or the drug to antibody ratio, if, that, um, if the payload, if there's too much payload on the antibody drug conjugate, then it can actually get cleared by the liver as a recognition of this toxin that's circulating through the bloodstream. So you don't want it too high because that, that can actually lead to less circulating uh, drug, uh, ironically. Um, so there is a, there is a uh, sweet spot there of having it loaded up with enough payload that you're really getting high concentration of delivery to that payload to the cells once it is delivered through the binding of that antibody to the antigen. So uh, to summarize, essentially, you're getting, by, by using an ADC, um, you're having targeted delivery to tumor cells or the tumor microenvironment of payload. And so you get high delivery, high concentration of that chemotherapy delivered into the tumor cells. And when there's a bystander effect, you also then have that payload being delivered to cells, even if they don't have expression of that antigen. So within the tumor microenvironment, as long as you have enough expression of that antigen, you get delivery of that chemotherapy, that payload to that, that whole area, then being able to have an impact on the various tumor cells. Now we're going to talk a bit about trope two and just to briefly say trope two is considered a uh, poor prognostic marker in most uh, data sets. Um, and uh, with that trope two expression on the tumor cells is not something we see uh, widely across normal tumor tissue. So this is an antigen then that we can target for these ADCs and delivery of that payload into the tumor cells. Um, on the bottom there, you see trope 2 intensity. And we'll get into some of the data sets, but in many cases, we don't, uh, the, the trope 2 expression itself ha has not been um, a marker for uh, response. And so part of that may be the bystander effect that, that I, I've touched on, um, but with the trope 2 expression, that's where the drug is uh, binding to. So here's an interesting component. And this, this is an introduction now into, we're going to go into some data sets. Saftuzumab govotikin and datapotumab deroxycan are both trope 2 antibody drug conjugates. They have a different DAR there. You see it's a payload with a similar mechanism of action. Uh, yet the toxicity profile of these two drugs is entirely different. And, and I'll just briefly point that out as an introduction to really listen to now as we dive into some of the data of these, because that's going to lead to um, really discussion around what exactly is happening and how exactly are these drugs working. And, and I think we're really on the forefront of understanding some of that, uh, that there's a lot more to dive into. And this is an extraordinary new framework upon which to deliver 
these chemo agents or these payloads uh, to build on. And with that, I will uh, pass this uh, back to Dr. Levy. Uh, Jacob, excellent overview uh, of the, the foundations that we, you know we'll be discussing in the later sessions. You know, I thought because you know trope two ADCs are not yet approved in lung cancer, we can only have a discussion through the lens of a crystal ball. And we're fortunate enough that I have procured here a crystal ball, an ADC crystal ball. And we're going to look into this crystal ball. Jacob, the year is January 2029. We're five years down the road in this crystal ball. And I'm going to take a step back here and ask a question, just a basic question, which is in January 2029, will ADCs be viewed more as targeted therapies or will they be viewed more as chemotherapy? Will we have biomarker enrichment strategies or do we need them? So the view of that crystal ball is a little hazy from here, but as best I can tell, the answer to your question is actually the answer you've given, which is yes. It is uh, targeted therapy. It is chemotherapy. As far as, you know, your specific question about biomarker, um, you know, it does not appear that trope 2 in the way it is now will serve as a biomarker, which really underlines the question of how exactly are these drugs working? And I think there are a couple, a few possibilities to this. One, the assay we have for TROP2 expression is not ideal. And there is a better way of looking at TROP2 expression. And maybe TROP2 expression does matter, and we just don't have a great way of testing for it. Maybe, another one, maybe TROP2 expression actually doesn't matter. Maybe this immune component is actually factoring in um, and, and has more of an impact than just the delivery of the payload, which is the most tangible, obvious uh, um, paradigm. You know, maybe it's more complex than that. It always is more complex. But but is that immune component actually something more? Or is there something that we just don't yet know anything about that's factoring into all of this? I'd say at the bottom line, the clinical data is what matters. We have a whole, you know, ways of explaining it and whatnot, but I'd say the clinical data is what matters. So the outcomes that we're seeing are what's really going to drive decision making. If we can develop a biomarker to better identify people, that's great. But, you know, we use carboplatin without a biomarker. We use gemcitabine without a biomarker and no one's screaming for biomarkers in those scenarios. Maybe this is a scenario where we just don't have a biomarker. And that doesn't mean that it's not also clinically useful as well. So I think in some ways, you know, this, this biomarker paradigm has been put with the genomics that we found in having such a genomic biomarker uh, setting. Um, but uh, this might not be one of those scenarios. Um, we'll have to see. All right, great. I'll give Charu and Salas just a brief second to come before we move on. We're, we're again, we're the crystal ball. Here it is. We're January 2029. We're five years down the road. Just briefly before we move on, I'll, Charu, I'll give you the first shot. Are we in a biomarker enrichment strategy or are we what come one, come all? I think we will move to a biomarker enrichment strategy given the diverse portfolio of ADCs uh, in development. I think we will have to bank on certain biomarkers to be able to use CMET focus ADCs versus HER2 focus ADCs. And I kind of agree with Jacob that maybe for trope 2, there isn't a biomarker, but I think for other populations, uh, there will be. So I, I don't think it's a one size fits all answer. I think for certain diseases or disease subsets or situations, we will need biomarkers. Great. Solange, I'll give you the parting shot before we move on to the next panel. Uh, excuse me, the next uh, module. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yes, we will need, they will be there, but we will need biomarkers. I somehow am not really agreeing with the fact that it's simply chemo. It's chemo, but bound to an antibody. And the antibody makes it biomarker related. What we probably don't know how to do now accurately is to measure the expression of this antigen, which is on the cell surface, how dynamic it is over time, and how to make a real picture of its expression at the time we deliver the, the, the agent. But it has to be targeted because by structure, it is targeted. So it's going to be personalized based on some biomarkers in the future, but we need to learn how to measure it. And we have been seeing in her too how complex it is to measure a biomarker which changes every second uh, in the tumor microenvironment, but also in normal cells. Great, great comments. We're, for the sake of time, going to move on to module two, 
emerging trope two targeting ABCs and non-small cell lung cancer, uh, the clinical evidence, and, and, and Solange, I'll turn it over to you for the second line data and beyond uh, for these drugs. Thanks so much. So the idea is now to go through the evidence we have. As you said, it's still not uh, practice because it's not reimbursed, not even uh, in the US where usually you are, the, you are the first to have access. Of course, it's still not in Europe, but really paving probably uh, the way of many antibody drug conjugates in the future for their for them entering our paradigm of, of evidence-based medicine. So first of all, let's speak about, I wouldn't I would say older data because it's about uh, sasituzumab govitecan, which is the first TROP2 directed uh, ADC, which has been evaluated across disease types in all epithelial tumors, with, of course, an emphasis on breast cancer and in lung cancer. We even have been seeing data in small cell lung cancer recently. This sasituzumab govitecan is uh, harboring a cleavable linker, as we have been seeing before, giving rise to probably a little stronger benefit in the tumor microenvironment, but also potentially allowing for this uh, theoretical bystander effect. So uh, a, a cleavable linker, uh, and of course, TROP2 uh, as being the target uh, of the antibody. The payload is something we all have in mind because we have seen it in the past. It's SN38, which is a metabolite of arinotecant. This is also the reason why some patients have more toxicity, toxicities uh, under urino, uh, arinotecan because it has to be eliminated uh, efficiently and we have polymorphism uh, uh, of the promoter of the elimination enzyme. So very important payload, top one that we know from the arinotecan time. It has a very high DAR, so drug to antibody ratio, seven to eight molecules. Uh, and uh, of course, by this antibody linked, uh, it has a, a potency to mitigate toxicity while it might also uh, improve uh, efficacy uh, and uh, activity in the, on the tumor in the tumor site. This is what we have. I say all data because it's 2021. So data we were seeing already some years ago or already proving that this works. Uh, but it was a, a trial which was looking at, again, all epithelial cancers. So it's not targeting uh, specifically lung cancer, probably reason why the emphasis was weaker as compared to the current times. In that trial, patients were pretreated at least uh, one, but sometimes and very often more than two lines of treatment, reporting a response rate of 17% and a median overall survival of seven months, median PFS of uh, almost five months in a highly predicted patient population. So something which uh, is about activity, but of course, some things that we would like to compare to what we have in hands in these uh, several and distinct lines of treatment. Toxicity, as you can see, is what we call manageable in the field of lung cancer and very uh, which is similar to what we have been observing with TOPO1 inhibitors, uh, like arinotecan, GI toxicity, hematotoxicity, alopecia, very often less than grade three, uh, leading to discontinuation in 4% of these patients. So the first proof of efficacy already three years ago. Okay, so let's move to the most, I would say, recent data set using the datopotamab deruxtecan. So of course it has three components, an IgG1 a targeting TROP2, a TROP1 inhibitor, the, the famous deruxtecan, DXD, that we have been seeing uh, with other ADCs, uh, and again, a cleavable linker. So the DAR is four in this uh, antibody drug conjugate. It has a short systemic ha uh, half-life and uh, uh, what is called stable linker payload in order to try to minimize the uh, systemic toxicity. And we hope again for a bystander tumor effect, uh, anti-tumor effect based on the cleavable link. But that is the data we had from the tropion pond tumor one, which was the first proof again, a bit in line with the sasetuzumab govitecan data of activity using several potential doses uh, of the antibody from four to eight mg per kg. Uh, you can see a response rate uh, in line with what described before between 24 uh, and 28% uh, with a median duration of response, which was uh, uh, more than six months, but uh, not reached at the time of analysis. And I prefer to look at uh, uh, this uh, a spider plot when you can, a uh, swimmer plot, sorry, when you can really see that uh, the all the uh, potential doses uh, are uh, a sign, but the median, the most important response rate and more durable responses looked to be observed with six mg per kg 
which was the dose used for further development uh, of this um, uh, uh, ADC, uh, specifically later on. Toxicity profile is slightly different from what we have been observing with sacetuzumab govitecum. I would say in this very early data set, probably a little more discontinuation in the range of 15% in this uh, analysis, with, of course, a very important scrutiny looking at ILD, inflammatory lung disease adjunct, uh, adjudicated to the drug, which was observed uh, in less than 5% of the patient population at the dose of sigmid per kg, with half of them being grade 3 uh, or 4. So something to pay attention to, but not very high level uh, of this toxicity. Grade C treatment-related adverse event was observed in one patient out of four, which looks like to be slightly higher than what was described before. But of course, this led to further development and the very obvious comparison of datopotamab derhuxtecon with what we have still as a standard second-line treatment, which is a docetaxel. Uh, in this trial, which was allowing all patients with or without uh, 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 actionable genomic alteration, we call that AGA, or we call, can call it also ocogene addiction, both type of population of patients could be enrolled after having received standard platinum as well as one line of standard anti-PD-1 or anti-PDL-1 and potentially also one line of targeted therapy if they had uh, an oncogene addiction. It was stratified by histology, by AGA, yes or not, by anti-PD-1 uh, monoclonal antibody included uh, in the most prior line or before in the most recent line or before, and uh, by region, the geography. Uh, this is a randomization one-to-one -one with dual primary endpoint with redistribution of the alpha between PFS, uh, which was uh, centrally reviewed, uh, blinded reviewed, uh, and overall survival. Secondary endpoint with the usual uh, activity described. As you can see, the primary endpoint, the uh, PFS uh, in the ITT population was met with a p-value of 0 0.04 and an improvement uh, here of median PFS from 3.7 months for docetaxel to 4.4 uh, as a median for datopotamab deruxtecon, representing a hazard ratio of 0 0.75. I think this is proportional hazard ratio with an early separation of the curve and a continuation of separation of this curve over time. Uh, you can consider it as a modest benefit in terms of PFS, but I'd like to stress also but the response rate is doubled, which means from 13 months to 26, uh, to 13 percent, sorry, for to 26 percent, which is something which might be important on a patient perspective, notably for the symptoms related to the late line treatments and late line evolution of the disease. By histology, the data are struggling. I would even say they are surprising. Uh, where you can see that in a uh, non squamous histology, this benefit becomes higher with a hazard ratio of 0 0.63, 3.7 to 5.6 as median PFS, and a duration of response which is increased by two months, and a response rate which is almost tripled in non squamous. While, as you can see, in squamous histology, with or without oncogene addiction, rarely observed there, uh, you can see that the benefit is not significant anymore. And I would even call it a qualitative interaction p-value because here docetaxel is overperforming datopotamab derukstecum. Maybe today I would not you I would not uh, bend that you like ask me why because we don't know why. I'm sure you will ask the question. Uh, there are lots of invented hypotheses about it. I'm not sure we have the answer, which is scientifically driven, but basically the benefit is observed in non squamous histology. If you think about non squamous uh, oncogene addiction or not, uh, here you have the PFS hazard before her non squamous without oncogene addiction, which is still 0 0.71. So, really meaning that in this non squamous population, the benefit is still in oncogene addiction and without oncogene addiction. This is the interim overall survival data with a hazard ratio at the time being of 0 0.9, which doesn't meet the boundary for significance at the time being, but is still uh, immature. Uh, and uh, I would say uh, in non squamous histology, again, you can see this very important difference with a hazard ratio of 0 0.77, almost reaching significance, while in the squamous subtype, again, you see the inverted mirror picture with probably docetaxel overperforming datopotamab derukstecon. So I would say close to significance in the non squamous histology, but this was not powered to only look at this specific subgroup. Toxicity. So again, remember in the early data set, it was slightly higher than we expected and we had been seeing with other TROP2ADC. 
So heat toxicity looks to be slightly lower in this phase three context with a discontinuation rate, which is uh, 8%, so way uh, lower than what was observed in the uh, early database. Uh, and you can see here again, the grade three toxicity in 8% of the patient population. What I would say is quite important to me is this toxicity profile is specific, different from docetaxel, but grossly equivalent or lower to the one observed with just axel in terms of numbers. So equivalent or lower, what I say comparison is difficult because toxicity profile and pattern uh, is different, right? Uh, there were fewer grain more and sweet treatment related adverse event if you want here uh, a summary. What is also important here is to describe the specific toxicity pattern. So doset axel, we all know the toxicity pattern, but when you look at this datobotamab derukstecon, very specifically, we see stomatitis and nausea which were the most frequently observed toxicity with stomatitis being the most annoying one. Hematological toxicities were seen including neutropenia and tibra neutropenia, but less than docetaxel and less than was early described with sacetuzumab gopitec. And no new safety signal was observed. Again, a slightly better toxicity profile as initially described. Uh, it's important to keep in mind this specificity, therefore, what right? we can uh, adjudicate as being a drug-related ILD was exactly in line as, as described previously. So one-digit numbers and, and low level of grade 3 and more toxicity. But so stomatitis is very frequently observed. Ocular events too, but it is mainly dry eyes, but it can also be annoying. So keep this in mind because we have to learn how to manage, prevent, or minimize these toxicities in the future, with again through me, somatitis being the, the most difficult to treat. So this is basically what we had in Tropon Long One. Again, we remember we had in Tropon Long One this oncogene addiction, a population of patients. So we have specific data produced uh, in oncogene addiction. It was first of all a uh, Ed Garon presentations a long time ago. Uh, we in this small subset of patients with oncogene addiction in the early data sets of datopotamab with a response rate of 35 percent. But we had recently Trop and Long Phi, which is focusing uh, on this uh, oncogene addiction, looking at all genomic alteration, but mainly here we observed EGFR patients, half of them, and ALK patients, a third of them. You can see here in the table a, a response rate of 36% in this free treated patient, at least one prior cytotoxic agent uh, in this metastatic say, setting, and very often, of course, a targeted therapy before, so two, three, or four lines of treatment. Uh, and this is response rate of 36% in EGFR. Uh, um, sorry, in all patients, 44% uh, in EGFR and 24% in ALK. So some differential to be seen in this patient population. Of course, we'll be happy to see the small subset because there are some patients with ROS1, with BRAP, and with MET in this patient population. Progression-free survival were around five months in the whole population, almost six in EGFR, four in the ALK patient population, and a very nice uh, spider plot here showing you that the response is observed in this patient population. So that's what we have with TROP2 targeting antibody drug conjugates today. Thank you, Solange, for that nice overview. Um, we're going to bring out the crystal ball again. It's changed color. If you didn't notice, it's green now for a different module. Uh, so I'm not going to ask you the crystal ball about histology and the preferential activity. We're going to have the crystal ball. The crystal ball, it's going to be now September, September 2024. And the FDA has decided to approve this drug based specific, uh, only on the PFS with no OS. And let's say that mature data shows you take out the genetic alteration patient population and the adenos because we know those patients benefit. And what you're left over with in the subset of patients with non-squamous is no benefit in OS, but we do see a benefit in PFS. Would you be inclined to use this drug? And if, if so, for who? Yeah. The answer is if you clean this data set, meaning that you remove from this data set the squamous histology. And you probably remove the oncogene addiction because you speak here about the patient population, which will be interesting, but in later lines of treatment, right? But you keep this non oncogene addicted, uh, non squamous non small cell lung cancer. Here I find, to my opinion, that the magnitude of benefit is worse. It's worse, in my opinion, it's worse probably using the scales of magnitude of benefit calculations, because here the hazard ratio for PFS is 0 0.6 something, and you are very close to have a significance uh, in the overall survival. More than that, you triple the response rate and you lower the bridge suite toxicity. 
So my answer is yes, I would use it. The only thing I would like to have guidance on is how can I improve the toxicity pattern and toxicity profile with supportive care for these patients? How can you manage stomatitis? How can you potentially lower the dose to make it uh, more tolerable? How can you potentially prevent it? Same thing with the ocular toxicity. And in general, I think every new class of drug had a learning curve into how to support this administration. So I think that's the only thing I would hope I would get until September. But in September, I would use it, yes. Okay. To be fair, balance, Charo and Jacob. Charo, I'll give you a, a, a say, and then Jacob can close us out on this question. I think the uh, efficacy is quite impressive in those patients with AGAs, to be honest with you. I think the study, or tropion lungo 5 included patients who had also received chemotherapy in the past. So TKI followed by chemotherapy, followed by ADCs, and still to get an impressive response rate, which is in the high 30s, low 40s, I think is incredible. Of course, we need larger data sets, but I think that may be one population that we reach out to this drug. And I completely agree that we need to learn how to manage the toxicity uh, patterns with this drug. Jacob, you get the final brief word. Yeah, I, so I would use it. I think you have pillars of clinical decision-making being toxicity profile, progression-free survival, overall survival, dosing. I mean, overall, if we're seeing an improvement generally in the toxicity profile, albeit as highlighted needing to learn more about how to better manage those, and we see improvement in response rates and progression-free survival, and at least a trend in overall survival is what we would see in your scenario. If it doesn't meet overall survival benefit, we're seeing a trend. So all those components to me make for what seems like a meaningful uh, drug for you to look at. Okay. All good answers. I think we'll see what that what, what, what lays ahead in the crystal ball in September 2024. We probably will have some answers by then from the FDA about whether this drug will be approved. We're going to move on for the sake of time to some of the first line data. Charo, I'll turn it over to you to discuss the role, the potential role of ADCs, trope 2 ADCs in the first line. Absolutely. And We've actually seen data with the uh, use of these agents in the second line setting, but what do we know about first line use? Um, as is the precedence, almost all drugs that are active in second line are perhaps slightly more active in first line. So there has been a lot of movement to combine these um, new ADCs with conventional chemotherapies, including platinum, as well as immunotherapy. Tropion Lungo 2 is one such study. Uh, that was a phase 1B. It's actually ongoing. So I should say that is a phase 1B study evaluating DATO DXT with pembrolizumab, either uh, just with immunotherapy or in combination with platinum chemotherapy. As you can see in the schema, since this is a phase 1B study, different doses of the uh, DATO DXT are being evaluated uh, with both carboplatin and cisplatin as demonstrated in these cohorts with the primary endpoint of uh, safety and tolerability. We do have early efficacy data. Remember, these are treatment-naive first-line patients. On the left, you can see almost all patients having a response um, either with chemotherapy or with immunotherapy alone, uh, as well as patients in the first-line setting that are demonstrated on the right. I will just note, note that patients in on the left-hand side may have been those patients that received immunotherapy first and then went on to receive combination chemotherapy. And as you can see, uh, the safety data is very much in line with what we would expect with the combination of platinum and another cytotoxic agent such as an ADC targeting trope 2, most frequent treatment emerging AEs being stomatitis, nausea, anemia, and fatigue. And then most of the grade three or higher were more frequently observed, as would be expected, with triplet rather than duplet uh, therapy. While that was data with DATO DXT, we know that SASE is also being evaluated in the, in the first line setting. Evoke O2 is one such open label phase two study where patients with treatment naive stage four lung cancer without activating alterations are receiving combination uh, sasituzumab with pembrolizumab or sasituzumab with pembrolizumab and carboplatin based on PDL one status. And as you can see, at the time of data cutoff, median follow-up for both these cohorts A and B that received immunotherapy uh, was short, five and five and a half months or 5.8 months respectively. Uh, but we did see some preliminary activity, which is demonstrated here 
And as you can see, overall, we did see partial responses. We saw a fair number of stable disease, as well as only a few patients with progressive disease. Safety data with Evoke O2 is slightly different. Remember, this is a different payload. Uh, SN38 causes slightly different toxicity. Uh, the most common toxicity we see here is diarrhea. We also see anemia. And as you can see, immune-mediated treatment emerging AEs are not significantly exacerbated with the use of these agents. And we really have to think about each ADC in terms of their different payload. Uh, just to give you a lens on what's coming in the future, you can see that there are various different trials evaluating the combination activity of these ADCs with either pembrolizumab, there are also some other uh, trials combining it with dermvalumab in the future. Uh, these are just a few. Uh, most of these trials have co-primary endpoints of primary uh, progression-free survival as well as overall survival. And Evoke O1, which is evaluating sasituzumab in the second-line setting, is uh, power powered at overall survival, which I think all of us will agree ultimately is one of the better uh, endpoints that we want to look at, not just for our patients, but just also to compare how how do we really use these, patients, these uh, drugs when they become available. So with that, I will stop and I'll pass it back to you, Ben. All right. So we are at the final uh, uh, part of the discussion. Um, and I'm going to go back here. I'm going to put out my crystal ball one more time. It's white now. Uh, we're going to finish off with a, a couple of questions related to the use of ADCs in the front line. We're at the year March 2026, month and year March 2026, two years and change. I put that there because maybe some of these frontline trials will have completed in red out, okay? And in this year, month, year, March 2026, we see that Tropion Lung 08 and Evoke 03 have read out and have mature data. This is again comparing pembrolizumab in the pd one greater than 50% to pembrolizumab plus an ADC, asking the question, if you add an ADC to pembro, can you outperform pembro alone in a pd one greater than 50%? These trials both show a PFS hazard ratio of 0.6, but no OS, no OS, but a nice PFS advantage. Um, Charu, your willingness to adopt ADCs in the front line in March 2026 based on the data that this crystal ball just spit out. Yeah, I would find it very surprising that with the PFS of uh, 0.6 that we would not that we would fail to see an overall survival advantage. I think it would just uh, increase my inquis inquisitiveness to find out more about the trials, subsequent therapies, what was the distribution of the therapies across the two arms. Uh, what was the response rate? What kind of toxicities that patients experience? But I think if I'm getting a PFS hazard ratio of 0.6, I would be very, very, very curious and would want to think about using this drug in the first-line setting. Great. Jacob, your thoughts on this. Let's say there is an OS advantage. Let's say it's, 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 it's modest at best. Let's say the OS advantage is the hazard ratio is potentially 0.8. It's confounded by the fact that we have some new second line drugs that have come along that are really good. What is it going to take for you, honestly, to use this drug in the front line in combination with Pembro, specifically for PDL1 greater than 50%? I mean, this is going to be a complicated discussion when we have data to talk more specific. But Telogen, this is you really are adding toxicity. So um, now we're going to have to compare this also to the ongoing file of chemo plus Pembro versus Pembro. Uh, because the question is going to be, does this really, in a cross trial comparison, outperform the uh, inclusion of carboplatin temefexet, for example, which is a pretty well-tolerated chemo regimen. So this is going to be a really complex uh, uh, set of data to, to weigh out. But I, I certainly am inclined to utilize the drug. Um, it'll depend a lot on the specifics, though. Yeah. I realize these are all very unfair questions, and you guys have been great uh, uh guests to play along with this. Solange, I'm going to get, throw a curveball at you uh, with this next one. Let's talk about the role of frontline trope 2 ADCs in the pd one less than 50%. And the question that you and I have discussed many times is, can these trope 2 ADCs replace platinum up front in patients with a pd one less than 50%? We have tropion lung 07, which is going to try to answer this question 
How do you see this playing out? And, and we, we, you know, our beloved Keynote 189 of carboplatin, pemetrexid, pembrolizumab that we use for the PDL one less than 50. Is there any role for a trope 2 ADC in the front line here? Thanks so much. I guess to use a TROP2 uh, ADC or any ADC in the front line, we really need to prove that it will beat what we have today. Because the, um, uh, I would say, our favorite uh, Keynote 189 uh, is our favorite Keynote 189 for a good reason. It's, it's extremely well tolerated. And we like to give it. It's easy to give. We are used to that. So anything which should beat this Keynote 189 uh, should uh, really show a benefit, which will probably be a benefit in PFS, striking, but even potentially a benefit in overall survival. It can also have a benefit in terms of simplicity of administration and lower side effects. But unfortunately, what we have been seeing today is that it doesn't look like this ADC we have today in hand are so much less toxic, right? They, are, they also have their set of toxicities. And we really need to show, therefore, a huge benefit in, uh, I would say, simplicity, meaning maybe just one component, uh, as well as efficacy to beat the 189. Why do I focus on 189? Because at the time being, I'm not so sure we are all extremely exciting to develop this uh, multiple histology strategies in squamous histology. Because we've been seeing the data in squamous. And at the time being, as in nothing, let me guess that in 2024, 2025, this will be the emphasis. So in non squamous we have a kind of a very nice tradition. And it will need to be beaten by a very, very strong, uh, I would say, competitor. I must admit, Ben, that I'm unsure that this is my main hope for the future of our patients in the next two years to come. I'm quite convinced this ADC have a role to play uh, if biomarker driven in late lines, in front line, really we need a biomarker for sure. And it has to strongly beat uh, 189. And at the timing, we are not there. So that, that's my feeling. What I really dislike is the idea to pile them on the platinum because then we really have the feeling we haven't gained anything, right? So uh, I'm a bit more, I would say, observing there than uh, I was in the early days with a new immunotherapy, for example. Yeah, such, such a great discussion. Uh, and, and, you know, we could go on and on here, but we're, we're, we're at time. Um, I do want to thank Jacob, Charu, and Sarlan for joining and being good sports. None of them were aware that I had procured the only Trope 2 ADC crystal ball in the world and presented it today. None of them were aware that this would be the conversation as it uh, was laid out in the panel discussion. So thank you for being incredible uh, sports and guests, giving your insight. A lot of unanswered questions, right? I think we, we, the, the future will hold the answers to many of these questions. And, and I think we all wait patiently we want to be able to use these drugs in the right patient population and mitigate the toxicity that we've seen so far. So thank you so much for joining. And we look forward to doing another one maybe in six to 12 months and having an entirely different data set to present. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash RGD 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Daiichi Sankyo Incorporated.